Shabbat Shalom, everybody. Shabbat shalom. Um, my name is Keisha Gallagher. I do live in Tennessee. I'm down in Knoxville, so it's not too far from you guys. Um, when Halisa approached me about doing a Becky book, and you all know what the Becky books are, of course, um, what kept coming to my mind over and over again was the new moon. And that's because um, about a year and a half ago, um, in Knoxville, there's a group of women that we meet with. And, you know, as we're studying the festivals and we're doing lots of things, we recognize the new moon just like you, do, you guys did with the Siddur on, on Shabbat, you know, but on the Shabbat previous to the new moon. But um, we wanted to do more. And so I started reading a lot in Jewish tradition with women's groups getting together on uh, the new moon. Traditionally, they set that aside for as, as sort of like a mini Shabbat for women. And they have traditions why they do that. And one of them is they say that the women didn't participate in the sin of the golden calf. I don't personally believe that that's true. I think the women were there because it was a party. And women are usually, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> orchestrate parties. But nevertheless, right now, since we don't have a temple... And we don't even have a, Sanhe a ruling Sanhedrin in Jerusalem. It's right now at this particular time that we live in, it's reserved more for women. So we thought, well, let's do a women's group. Let's get together and, and do this and see, see how it goes. And it has been amazing, uh, this group that we get together with. Uh, we've had, um, it started off really small, and now it's so big, we almost are going to have to break it off and do, because we meet in homes, break it off and do it in two groups. Um, and the light from it is what amazes me more than anything because we're drawing in a crowd that I did not expect with the new moon. A lot of women that are in the church that are, you know, it's like Abba's just now starting to open their eyes and they're curious about all this, uh, the Shabbat. And they, a lot of these women homeschool, so they're in these homeschool groups and they hear these women talking about the festivals and they want to know more. So I don't know if it's just because it's women, it sort of disarms them a little bit uh, when we get together, but um, they're curious. And so when they come, they love it. And um, so anyway, that's, that's the reason why I started, I wanted to start the Becky book with the, on the biblical new moon. I think it's very misunderstood. And I also believe that it's left in a little bit of obscurity. When we see the new moon in scripture, which is not in a lot of places, it's usually put with the Shabbat and the Moedim, all the festivals. So it has great importance, but it's like we can't really see. The, the light is very dim for us in, in that regard. So I wanted to bring a little bit of light to that. And uh, it's a little strange because when we get together, one of the things that we do is we light candles. And I'm going to explain some of that, the reason why we do that. Um, and not like the Shabbat candles. We each have our own candle representing our own light. And we sort of pass that light to each other because when the new moon was recognized in Old Testament times and, and in uh, the first century, what would they do? They would light signal fires. So we, we do that. We pray. We eat. We blow the shofar. We dance. We're often outside, you know, and, and so you're, you've got neighbors, and so you've got this group of women, and what are they doing? A lot of them will have prayer shawls or just shawls over their head, and, you know, some of us, me, have a black cat, and, you know, so it's sort of people are like, ugh, what, what are these women doing? Is it, uh, uh, my husband jokes and says, this isn't witchy at all. That's one of his <laughs> things. <laughs> But, but the truth is, because it's been left in obscurity, uh, I think we tend to fear things. And um, on the drive here, I was listening to uh, Rabbi David Foreman's, his Al Al uh, Alpha Beta program. And I don't know, some of you may have already watched this. This year he put one out about uh, Rosh Hashanah, and I can't remember the exact name of it. But one of the things he mentioned was that, you know, they can see and track who, how many, you know, which videos get the most hits. You know, every week they do the tour portion. Uh, and with the festivals, you know, all they get a lot of hits, except for Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Out of all the videos that they produce, those get the less hits, the, the least amount of hits. And I was just like, wow. So his idea, you know, they sit and ponder this. Why do we have... Um, 
less curiosity at the high holy days. You know, they get plenty of hits for Passover, even Tishbaav. I mean, they, they, there's a flood of traffic, but why not for the high holy days? And so I found that just extremely curious. What are the high holy days about? Judgment. They're bringing in, um, you know, the coronation of the king, but there is going to be a judgment. So he was even saying that one of his favorite set of videos that he has done is over the book of Jonah for uh, Yom Kippur. And actually, I've watched that series. It's really, really good. And, I was, and so I guess he's surprised thinking, why aren't people, you know, why, why, don't, why aren't they for the high holy days? Why aren't they interested in it? And his conclusion was it has something to do with fear because we all fear judgment. And so it made me think of um, 1 John uh, chapter 4, and I'm going to read this. I have, the, the Father has had me in this particular chapter all year long. I don't know why. Well, I do know somewhat why. But uh, I, uh, I used to have anxiety attacks uh, back about 10 years ago. And I used to quote uh, 1 John all the time, but I don't think I really even understood what it was saying. And so I'm just going to read a portion of that to you right now. Let's see, I'm going to start in, um, I'll start in verse 13. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. We have seen and testify that the father has sent the son to be the savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Yeshua is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. We have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. God is love and the one who abides in love abides in God and God abides in him. By this, love is perfected with us so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves punishment. And the one who fears is not perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. And so that scripture right there has just been, I don't know, my theme for this year. It's what is the opposite of love? It's fear. It's not hate. Hate's just a symptom of fear. And I think like what Rabbi Foreman was talking about with the high holy days, why does it get the least amount of hits? Because people, we want to more run and hide. We want to crouch in the corner when we think that we're being examined. And so with the new moon, it's sort of the same thing. We, we have lack of knowledge on it. So uh, when we see a group of women like our little group that gets together and we got the shofar going and the candles burning and there might be some music and some dancing and some prayers and there might be barefoot w w foot women dancing in the backyard. It's a little, it could be a little scary. It, we're, we're fearing the, the negative side of that or a perverted version of that. But that what we see now is people coming in, they're experiencing love and it eradicates that fear but it's taking fear also away from the other things like the Shabbat and the festivals and so they're wanting to learn and so since we're on the uh, brink of Rosh Hashanah right now that is the only Moedim that is a high holy day I just wanted to bring that in since we're going into that judgment we cast ourselves on his mercies, his compassion. We, you know, the focus of a, of a lot of the liturgy is on those 13 attributes of the Holy One. And the biggest thing is his chesed, his loving kindness, his loyalty to the covenant and love for us. And we know that Yeshua has paid that penalty so that we can stand and not fear. So anyway, I'll begin the slides now. So with the Becky book, I really was trying to speak to the very beginner. And so what I did was take them to the very beginning. And I know you guys know this very well, being here with the creation gospel author. The first mention of the moon is in Genesis 1 on day 4. 
And God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth. And it was so. God made two great lights, the greater light to govern the day, the lesser light to govern the night. He made the stars also. God placed them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth and to govern the day and the night and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. There was evening and there was morning, a fourth day. So right there in Genesis, we get the purpose of the luminaries. Um, they each have a function and a purpose and sometimes they share in those purposes. The first one is they separate day from night. They are for signs, seasons, days, and years. They give light to the earth. They govern day and night, and they separate light from the darkness. And one of the things I really tried to point out in the book is these are real physical duties of these luminaries. But I kept trying to draw the reader in to see that the natural is a picture of the spiritual. So these are also spiritual or uh, figurative duties that they also have. They separate the day from the night, but we're talking about a spiritual day and a spiritual night. Um, the same thing with giving light to the earth. We can give that light of the Messiah, that's his spirit, to the earth. So they are heavenly governors. What I'm going to do is sort of take you through a, a, a brief version of what I did in the book. It was just start there in the beginning with the luminaries and explain that they are really a depiction of God's calendar. His Adonai's calendar is in the sky. That's what the sun, the moon, and the stars all do. They're like a giant clock. And why is this important? Because time is important to our creator. I think he is like the essence of time, the one who was and, and is and is to come. He is time. And what do calendars do? They dictate when we celebrate, when we eat, when we sleep. Um, they mark appointments. They do anniversaries. Everything we do revolves around a calendar of some sort. I mean, even to be here today at this meeting, you had to look at a clock and know the calendar and know what time it was just to even be here to gather. And so it is important to him. It's so important that no one, you ha no one can get through earth without looking up and seeing his clock and calendar in the sky. And this is just a picture of someone's depiction of the, the Sanhedrin um, or the priest being, uh, announcing the new moon with the trumpets. You can see it down there in the right-hand corner. So what, does, what is the new moon? It's, in Hebrew, it's the Rosh Chodesh, the head of the month. And I know you guys know this. Our calendar is on the Gregorian calendar in the West is solely solar-based. But the Hebrew calendar is lunar. It's lun lunar solar, actually. The, the sun is consulted to keep the seasons in check. But um, the word chodesh, we were just singing that today when we were reading the Torah portion from the New Testament. Uh, it is based in that word to renew, chadash, or to repair, to be new. That is the root of Chodesh. And in Hebrew, the same word for month is the same word for new moon. They're really tightly intertwined. And for those of you that um, are interested, and I did not put this in the book, when we look at the Hebrew letters there, uh, the, the Chet, the Dalet, and the Sheen, right in the middle is the, the Dalet, which is the Delet, which is the door. So right here with this month, we have a door or a pathway. And on the outside, you have the chet, which is the fences that we were talking about, <laughs> and then the sheen, which can mean fire. So it looks like the path into contained fire, which I'm thinking of as the holy fire, right? That holy, holy calendar. This is what our months are. So the moon specifically has its own duties. It sets the boundaries for our months. It keeps or guards the Moedim or the festivals. It warns of things to come. I mean, I know you guys have all heard about the blood moons, right? <laughs> or my grandma used to say, I haven't seen you in a blue moon. You know, there's all these different this moons. 
uh, one of my friends, uh, she read the booklet and she sent me a text and she says, I devoured it like a moon pie. And you guys all know what, you know, <laughs> you guys all know what moon pies are around here, right? <laughs> uh, and it reflects the light of the sun, which we're supposed to be doing, reflecting that light of the sun. We read this passage today, Psalm 104, 19. He made the moon for the seasons, or the Moedim, and the sun knows the place that it's setting. So according to this psalm, the moon is made for the Moedim, for the sake of the festivals. That's, how it, that's its primary duty in a spiritual significance, is to keep us on track so that we're gathering together at the proper times, the proper seasons for Adonai's holy days. And it marks those timings of the new months. And as I've learned from Halisa in the Creation Gospel Workbook 1, each uh, a month, the word for month in English, it's month, right? It comes from the moon. Even though our calendar doesn't follow that, I mean, it's, at some point, the ancients, they knew this. And this is one of my favorite passages, too. This is from Psalm 19, 1 through 3. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. Day into day, utter speech, and night into night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. So they actually have a voice, the heavenly luminaries. They utter speech. Do we understand what they're saying? And they're revealing knowledge. Who do you guys think this is? Joshua. Who's he talking to, you think? Nicodemus. Yes. <laughs> okay, so what sort of speech and knowledge do you think that the stars, the moon, the sun are ultimately speaking to the whole world? There's a creator. Yes. And he also has some good news for us, right? He has, a, he has a gospel message. And I think that's ultimately the spiritual light that they're telling the whole world every single night. And I think we're really far removed from this because, I mean, we live in a society where the flip of a switch and we've got light at night. We have light pollution. Um, at, I, I know if I, every time I've went out west, I am always amazed by the sky and the, especially the stars at night. I don't know why the sky seems so much bigger there. Maybe it is the lack of people and light pollution, but it's, I feel like I can see into the solar system. I had, my in-laws used to have a property in Sedona, Arizona, and I would just lay outside. It was like being in a planetarium. I mean, it was just amazing. I, was, I didn't even know that many stars could even be seen. And, um, if we didn't have television and, and lights and computers, what would we be doing? You think we'd be outside more looking up? And I think that's one reason why Nicodemus, you know, he, he may have wanted to approach Yeshua in the evening, maybe to get him alone because he was, you know, uh, surrounded by people all the time. But when they were speaking in John chapter 3, and it was nighttime, do you think they may have looked up at the, into the sky when he's telling Nicodemus about you must be born again or born from above is literally what it says in Greek. So I believe the moon has, just like the stars, speaks the good news, the gospel message. Um, it also tells us a lot about our personal walk, our life. You know, the moon reflects the light of the sun, just like we're supposed to reflect the light of the sun of Adonai. But it waxes, it wanes, sometimes it has a lot of light and you can see a lot and sometimes it's completely black. I mean, the moon is completely dark, but then it renews itself. And then gradually that light grows and then and starts decreasing. So there's this ebb and flow. And I know even in my own life with um, my walk with the Father, it's, there's, there's a constant waxing and waning sometimes in my faith. Or just sometimes um, I might get a little further away and then he'll draw me back or I might feel really dry. And, but then it comes back. There's that, that cycle. We see that cycle even with the, the feast days, I believe. 
But what that uh, gospel does and what the moon shows is that these are giving light to the earth. And it's a day and it's a monthly reminder that, you know what, you might be in a valley right now. You might be in a dark place right now. But there's always hope for renewal and uh, restoration and reconciliation. And that, I believe, is that spiritual light that's given in the moon. If we watched its phases every single night, I think that we would have a better understanding of that. So you must be born again. This is what Yeshua told Nicodemus. And he compared it to a womb. And I think you can see a picture of the womb in the moon as well. It's regular arrival and it's growth to fullness, followed by its disappearance. It's long been a visible symbol of life, death, and rebirth. So with every new moon, we see a necessity of being born from above, born again. And it becomes even more interesting if you consider that the assembly of Adonai and the body of Messiah is compared to a woman, a bride, a wife. So women's bodies in the natural have a lunar cycle. Um, and I can tell you just by what the phase the moon's in, pretty much where I'm going to be. Now, men, I know this is not a comfortable topic, but you all have women in your lives. So you, you see this same picture and you're meant to learn something from that as well. <laughs> So, um, what happens in that woman's body is sort of that same picture with the moon. You know, there's a shedding, there's a death of a seed is not implanted, and then uh, there's a renewal, a hope for new life. So, here's just some of the spiritual themes, just to uh, sort of recap a little bit. The, the moon pictures a spiritual womb. In the natural... It even affects the flow of waters, tides, oceans, you know, that, that gravitational pull, which I think is, is quite amazing. And that sort of even has a waxing and waning to it, doesn't it? It gives light in the darkness. In the waxing and waning, there's a picture of death, burial, and resurrection. We see the fertility cycles of women, which has to do with life. And it gives signs to the earth. I mean, we, we have lunar eclipses. We have blood moons. Um, we have harvest moons, blue moons. There, there's all kinds of different things that um, are shown to us in the moon. With the darkness, you see the picture of something being hidden, but then revealed. And I think that's what's happening right now with, uh, that the moon shows, with not just with uh, the gospel and, and the festivals, but... For a long time, well, not a long time, for several decades, Adonai has been opening eyes to his Shabbat and his festivals, his calendar, but the moon hasn't played a huge role in that, sort of been in the background, sort of hidden back in the back. That's also happened a lot with women over the centuries, by the way, so I don't think it's coincidence that there's, there's more of a, there's more of a, a return or um, we're starting to get that little sliver of light there in regards to both that, the women and, and the moon. So it's also a metaphorical picture of, of Israel because we are the bride of Messiah. Judaism sees that same picture. They see the, um, the moon being a reflection of Abba's light. Same thing. So the new moon in scripture, when you go to look up the scriptures, as a matter of fact, because there was so few, I was able to list every, in the booklet every single scripture on the new moon because there's not a lot. In the Torah, the only reference, direct reference is Numbers 10.10. 10. And it says, also in the day of your gladness and in your appointed feast, and on the first days of your months, you shall blow the trumpets of your burnt offerings and over the sacrifices of your peace offerings, and they shall be as a reminder of you before your God. I am Adonai, your God. So in this case, when we come and meet him at the new moon, it's a reminder of us to him. I think that's fascinating. I think that's one reason why 
we have testimony after testimony of answered prayers specifically at the new moon. Not that he doesn't hear us any old day of the week. I know he does, but it's just fascinating to me. And maybe he's allowing us to see that so that we can see we are putting ourselves and we're always praying for our families, our friends, our children, and the prayers are being answered. And probably one of the most uh, famous verses that, uh, on the new moon is Isaiah 66, 23. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another, all flesh shall come to worship before me, says Adonai. So one day we won't miss a new moon. We won't miss a Shabbat. We won't miss any of the festivals. We are going to come before him and worship. So in the, in the booklet that you're going to be able to look through, you'll see other scriptures, but there's just one that I wanted to, to bring out. And this is when Elisha raises the Shunammite son. Because, I don't know, there's just so many things in this passage. I love it. Uh, for those of you that don't know, um, Elisha was coming through the Shunammite's town as he would make his little rounds. And every time that he would come through, she would say, come, come to my house, come to my house. I have lechem, eat, eat bread at my house. And so uh, she, he came so often, I guess, that she told her husband, let's build an upper chamber for him to have a place to rest. And it's actually a little aliyah, that's what it is in Hebrew, they, they built. And so they built it. And one day, you know, after, you know, Elisha's appreciative of, of her gesture, and he, so he asked his servant Gehazi, what, what can I do to honor this woman? I mean, she's, you know, she's been really good to us. And he says, well, you know, her husband's old and she doesn't have any children. And so um, he, tells, um, he tells the Shunammite that one day, this, at this season, next year, you will have a son. Just like Sarah was told, right? Same picture. And she does. And then the kid gets a little bit bigger and he starts working in the field with his father and he gets a headache. They send him back to mom. And he ends up dying on her lap. Well, of course, she's devastated. And so once she realizes he's dead, this is what she does. In 2 Kings 4, 23, it says, this is her husband calling to her. He doesn't even know what's happened. And he says, hey, uh, uh, why will you go to him today? She says, I'm going to go look for Elisha. She gets on her little donkey and she's off. And he says, why will you go to him today? It is neither new moon nor Shabbat. So in other words, her custom was to seek out a man of God at the new moon and Shabbat. And she said to him, it will be well. Actually, all she said to him was, shalom. She was out of there. She was, she was like, see you later. I'm gone. And so she came to, to Elijah and she explains what happens. And of course, he comes back. And this is the passage in 2 Kings 4, 32 through 35. It says, when Elisha came into the house, behold, the lad was dead and laid on his bed. So he entered and he shut the door behind them both and he prayed to Adonai. And, when, and he went up and he lay on the child and put his mouth on his mouth and his eyes on his eyes and his hands on his hands and he stretched himself on him and the flesh of the child became warm. Then he returned and walked in the house once back and forth and went up and stretched himself on him and the lad sneezed seven times and the lad opened his eyes i just find this fascinating because we have the new moon mentioned here and then what does elisha do he lays right it's like he's a reflection remember the moon's supposed to reflect it's like he's reflecting all the life that resides in him which is the spirit of messiah and he's putting it on this dead child which is like that dark moon and then all of a sudden right after the reflecting, his mouth becomes his mouth, his eyes, his eyes, his warmth. He takes on the warmth. He gets up, and I don't quite understand the sneezing part yet, other than it has to have to do with breath. <laughs> but he sneezed seven times, so he is full of the Spirit of God, and he rises, which the moon has pictures that resurrection, right? That new birth. So anyway, I do mention this briefly in the book, but it's that reflecting thing. There is power there. And so you guys, I know, have been around long enough to hear plenty of calendar issues 
and the Hebraic roots, and you know, there's lots of different calendars. And one of the challenges with this booklet was I did not want to talk about those. I didn't even want to go there. I didn't want to discuss anything. <laughs> uh, I didn't want to, uh, that was, I want people to celebrate. And so that's what Amen. the book is about. Uh, I don't care when you want to do it. If you have your own calendar, follow it, but celebrate, celebrate the new moon. But I personally follow um, the Jewish calendar or the Hillel II's calendar. And so I do mention that, but I also mention if you want to do your own thing and do it, do it. Just celebrate. Um, so there is a difference between the astronomical new moon and the conjunction, which I know some people believe the new moon is the conjunction when the moon is dark. I personally do not believe that's the case because there's not a sliver of light yet. There's not, it's like a seed being in the ground and hasn't sprouted yet, in my opinion. It's the same picture. It's still in darkness. When that first little bit comes up out of the ground from a seed, that's when I know that there's definitely life in that seed. And so that's the picture, I think, with the sliver of the new moon. No offense to anyone if you think it's the conjunction. And in Jewish history, what they would do is when they did cite it, two witnesses had to report to the Sanhedrin, that ruling body in Jerusalem, and the new moon would be declared. I think I have a quote from that maybe in here. I don't remember. See, it's hard to see the dark moon. <laughs> <laughs> and this one's probably a little past a sliver, but it's the closest one I could get with a good, with a good photograph. There it is, right there in the center of this slide here. And this is just a quote from um, the Jewish Encyclopedia online. Uh, once confirmed, the president of the Sanhedrin would call out, the new moon is consecrated. Then the whole assembly of people twice repeated... It is consecrated. It's, it's consecrated. In other words, everybody was agreeing and joining in unity, and then the new month would begin. And so for those that were close to Jerusalem, um, it would be announced. And then starting on the Mount of Olives, they would start these signal fires. And I have a picture in here. Have you guys seen Lord of the Rings by chance? Or is that pagan? I don't know. I like it. Uh, <laughs> uh, but one of the things when they were trying to get people to warn them and to gather for war, they would light from one mountain and then the mountain down the way, they would see the signal and then they would light. Well, this is how the new moon was announced around um, uh, Israel, which is, I, I think is really neat. And that's one reason why we like candles as women, we just have to use little votive ones. We have one that we just basically would represent, you know, the light that we're given, which is Messiah. And then we light. One, one person lights the next person. And that's sort of what happens in us, right? When we're around people, it's sort of one lights the other. But um, they also did send messengers around too. And this is so that everyone was in unity. There's another just depiction Psalm 81 is usually recited at this time. To blow the trumpet at the new moon, at the full moon on our feast day. Which we are getting ready to do tomorrow. Tomorrow evening. So there it is. I think this is from a picture from the Lord of the Rings. But do you see the fire? And then the one in the distance. And when I first saw this picture, I thought that was water. It's not water, it's clouds. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, because like, or is it an ocean? But it's clouds. They're so high up, right? That's, so that's clouds there in the center. So the first month and the new year. And I know Lisa will talk about this tomorrow because it's Rosh Hashanah, right? The head of the year. But yet we also have the head of the, the festival calendar, which is in Nisan for Passover. Uh, Judaism celebrates four new years. So... If you're not confused now, we'll explain that to you later. <laughs> but I, I, for the festival calendar, when he brought them out of Egypt, the first thing he did was get everybody on the same page. As a matter of fact, I kind of think when he returned, he's going to do the same thing. <laughs> um, the, hopeful, yes. And for those who actually listen, some will be like, no, we, we've got our own calendar, thanks. This month, Nisan, shall be the beginning of months for you. It is to be the first month of the year to you. So this is the beginning of the months for the festival calendar. And uh, I think Jews get accused of 
trying to start their own new year sometimes, you know, for Rosh Hashanah. And I think it's funny because it's still the seventh month for them. They're not denying it by any means. Uh, But on the festival calendar here, we have it it with Nisan. And so how does the original Passover and Exodus relate to that beginning of months? And I do explain that somewhat in the book because it's that picture again of being born anew when they come through you know, the, the blood that's placed on that doorpost and then they walk through the waters. That is a birthing process through the blood and the water, right? Amen. And so um, I, I wanted to point that out because I know that I'm going to have a lot of readers that um, uh, are really still in the church, right? They're still just learning. And this is just a sample. The second half of the book is just those Uh, 12, well, 13 Hebrew months, okay? And what I did was try to give people an idea of what can we do if we do gather together, what are we going to talk about? What are we going to eat? You know, what are we going to do besides dance around in the backyard with shofars? (laughs) Well, we do more than that. I'm just, but it is fun. Uh, (laughs) um, So each Hebrew month, we just started gathering a lot of information about it. And I did use a lot of Jewish tradition. And so you will see all these bullet points, the month uh, and what that month means, and then the tribe that's associated with that month. Now, this is directly from Jewish tradition. They have signed a tribe for each one of the months. And they do that um, based on, you know, they, they did it with careful consideration. They're based on the blessings that Jacob gave to his sons, that Moses gave to the tribes. Uh, the meanings of their names, there was a lot of things that were um, taken into consideration. And so I encourage people, use this if you want to or don't. But I wanted people to have an idea of things that they could to do or talk about. So, for example, our upcoming month, Tishrei, means eat to me, eat to me, eat, hmm, sorry, excuse me. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it means permanence, enduring, ever-flowing brooks to begin. And the tribe is Ephraim, meaning double fruitfulness. And so we also know within this month is all those uh, fall holy days, right? We have um, with the feast, we have Rosh Hashanah, the days of Ah, Yom Kippur, Sukkot, the last great eighth day. There's uh, lots of themes. So if we are celebrating a month like this month where there is festivals and holidays, um, we will talk about those. We'll discuss them. We may even make plans to get together if it's something minor or a traditional holy day or holiday. Um, I also mentioned the mazel and I did try to explain this really well because those stars, remember from day four, the creator put those in the sky. And I don't want anyone to think that this has something to do with uh, new age astrology. It doesn't. New Age astrologists did not put the constellations in the sky. Um, I don't know, I did. And there are 12 primary ones that follow the same ecliptic as the sun and moon through the sky. Uh, there's other ones around outside of that little imaginary line that they, that they follow. But the 12 main ones, um, they do have meaning. I don't think they predict your future or your love life or whether you should buy a car today. Um, but what they do cry is that good news. I, I see the, the gospel going through there. So for example, the constellation that's in the sky for our upcoming month is Libra. Um, and Libra is the scales. What happens this month? Right. These are, these are Adonai signs and stars. They're not, yeah, they're not, um, they're, everything has a perversion and a counterfeit. Don't let the perversions and counterfeits scare you away. It's just like, you know, the rainbow is being trying to be stripped from us in, in some ways for it with a counterfeit. And it's, um, it's a shame. So also I just put the themes. And for, in our case, this month, it's the, the themes have to do with the ha- ha Holy Days. Just scripture references involved in that. And then foods. We will try to bring, we always want to have little snacky foods and stuff for people to eat as we fellowship. And um, so I put apples and honey, pomegranates, things that you're, you would consider traditional foods for this season. And under this in the book, I try to tie these themes together so that you could put together 
a teaching. You could use it as springboard or to do more study, whatever you want to do. So that's what the second half is. And at the very back of the book, um, I put blessings. The ones that you see from your Siddur today, this one was more like a, a, a candle lighting blessing that we sort of came up with to light those candles I was mentioning earlier. But um, we do read the liturgy for the sanctification of the new month uh, when we get together. And I put it in the back so that you could find it really easily, no matter what month you were celebrating. And this is what we, we read this earlier today. The Psalms that are associated with it. And I found it really interesting. This is from the Talmud, Sanhedrin 42a. It says, anyone who blesses the month in its time is as if he is greeting the Shekhinah, the divine presence. Which I found fascinating because, you know, that's also a greeting really for Shabbat, isn't it? So I think that the new moon has a lot to do with the Shabbat and the festivals, and I think that the Father's revealing that to us right now. Do you guys have any questions? Or about the booklet, maybe? What might be in there or might not be in there? <laughs> you know, I'd, I'd like to comment, as you were talking about you and the ladies get together, it's, it's like, uh, for you all, it's a time of freedom to leave the world and just concentrate and focus on the word and, and how you tie all this together. It's a liberty. It is a liberty. And, and you know what? We love it. And we've just had a lot of good fruit come from it. Mm -hmm. it, <laughs> unless you're hosting yeah <laughs> if you're hosting there's some housework <laughs> but it's it's good it's a time of unity as you sing it all oh, everybody coming in it, it brings oneness to it does and we have women from all different walks of uh, uh, maturity in torah or observance levels we even have some that do not we typically follow the jewish calendar but we have some that believe, you know, the conjunction or the moon has to be sighted in Israel. You know, that they're not, we're not, not an exact science. But you know what? No one makes that the focus. The focus is always on gathering and unity and being together, which I find, you know, really refreshing. And so we're drawing in people from um, the church, which has amazed me. That was not anything we ever expected to happen. Um, and so they're coming in, and they're joining, and they're learning, and they're wanting to know more. And some of them have started keeping Sabbath. It's just like little baby steps. They're taking little baby steps. They're starting to do things with their kids. Or, you know, it, it's, some of them have bought shofars since, uh, since, since then and are teaching their children to do that. And this also it shows that instead of your agenda, it's more important together than to hack each other to death with your agenda sort of. It is. It is. Well, one of the things, I have a good friend, her name is Deborah uh, in Knoxville. Actually, I think she's going to be here tomorrow. You guys can meet her. But um, she's the one that worked with me to get this going. She's very, I'm, I'm newer to Knoxville, and she's very connected with a lot of people. And she was like, let's just do it. And I was like, let's do it. I like that. I like that attitude. <laughs> and... Um, one of the things we set forth from the very beginning is we want this place to be safe. When we gather together, we want it to be like a womb, a place where things can grow, you know, n not where someone's going to be beat up or challenged or whatever. And, um, and some of these women, their, their husbands are Torah observant. Some of them aren't, uh, which, is, which is fine. But we wanted them to be comfortable enough to be able to express, too. Because the highlight or the big part of everything that we do is prayer. We pray for at least an hour. And that's not the liturgy. That is just us praying. Um, and so a lot of these women w are pouring their hearts out. And, and so I think that's that feminine thing. That's the, a comfort zone, that, that womb thing. Uh, I was um, given this presentation actually uh, last Shabbat. And one of the men was, he was why aren't the men invited? And I'm like, well, we're not excluding them. You know, if you, if you want to start your new men group, go do it. You know, I don't care. I, my, my, I encourage people, start a group. Uh, but for this particular group, because I, there was some women there, and afterwards they were like, oh, are you going to start letting them in? They were literally, literally a little afraid, like, oh, it's going <laughs> to. And it wasn't because they don't want their husbands there. It was just like, There's, this renews me every month. And, you know, I get, we get a lot of prayer in. And I was like, well, so our, we're going to remain that, but 
we encourage, of course, men to get together. So I've, get, I've gotten some flack from that because why a women's group? Uh, like we're excluding them. <laughs> and I'm like, we're, nobody's being excluded. As a matter of fact, my husband, since I've started doing this, he gets, I think he has seen the fruit from it. And he's also seen the blessings. And so he's, when, when are y'all getting together for the new moon? Not that he wants to get rid of me either, hopefully. <laughs> but uh, it's, it's, just, it's just seeing um, answered prayers and, and the unity and the growth. And it's just, it's a blessing. It is. It is. Anything else, guys? I hope you enjoyed the, the, the book. Yeah. You can thank Kalisa.